Okay, welcome. This is just the Bible talk or meetup. Um, so let me just slide this slideshow. So, okay, the Bible. Now, what I hear a lot from people, and I think probably many of you have also either said or heard this, you have your interpretation and I have mine. I heard that a lot. I'm sure you have too if you're not if you didn't say it yourself. This is what Catholics and Protestants say about the Bible for the most part. Um when something is asked about a particular scripture and let's say person A um thinks, well, let's say it's talking about, I don't know, lying. And then they might say, well, they say all liars are not going to have their part in the lake of fire. Some might say, well, that doesn't mean all liars, you know. That's how they're interpreting it. Why somebody else interpret it, interpret it as, no, it means all liars. So what's going on here? We have a disagreement. And so when a disagreement tends to happen about a particular scripture, people normally just throw this out there and say, you have your interpretation and I have mine. Now, why do people talk like this? Um, well, some just do this to get along. They don't want to have a debate or they don't want to start um maybe something they don't they don't want to finish or they don't want to really fight i guess quote unquote um some don't want to admit that they're wrong they probably see the evidence of that their interpretation is probably incorrect but they want to stick with it um some might think that this is just the right thing to say and then some don't really want to talk about it, right? Religion, scripture, people tend to not want to talk about that. But the question really is, do we talk like this when it comes to everything else, right? So let me say example. Um, you have a boss. Your boss says, be at work at 6 o'clock in the morning. You come at 6 o'clock at night. Your boss comes up to you and says, what happened? I thought I told you to come six o'clock in the morning. And you said, I thought you meant six o'clock at night. What will your boss do? Well, your boss might fire you. Your boss might write you up, you know. However, with this type of, and you might say, it's, that's what he might do or she might do. Why? Well, first of all, it, there is no, you have your interpretation and I have mine. There is no, what you thought you meant. No, it's, I said this. Why didn't you follow up on that? Okay, I said six o'clock in the morning. Why did you think six o'clock at night? Now, some might say, well, maybe the person thought... Well, maybe the person normally comes 6 o'clock at night. So when you say 6 o'clock in the morning, they just took it, changed it in their mind, and say, oh, no, he must have meant this. But would that ride with your boss? No, that's not going to ride. Because the person said 6 o'clock in the morning. Okay. So you could think, what you want to think when it comes to this situation, right? But your boss still has every right to write you up, to punish you, to fire you, okay? Because why? Because he gave an instruction, a specific instruction, and you just didn't follow it. Isn't that right? Because you decided to not take what he said you decided to just think of something on your own if that makes sense let's see now let's take that example and put it into a scriptural example okay 
had this analogy. Christ says, and this is what he says in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Protestants say, you don't need to be, to be baptized to be saved. That's what they say. Now, I'm not saying all of them say that, but a nice bulk say, say this. Christ comes up to you and says, What happened? I thought I told you to be baptized so you can be saved. And you say, I thought you meant we didn't need to be baptized to be saved. What will Christ do? Because you got people looking at this saying, This does not mean I need to be baptized to be saved. Believe it or not. That is what they're saying. Okay. You would think nobody would look at this and say that don't need baptism for salvation. But you got a lot of Protestants saying you don't need baptism to be saved. They look at this and say, I don't need baptism. All I need is belief. What will Christ do? So what's going on here? They are interpreting this some other type of way. But the thing is, it's so blatant and it's so direct. It's so one, two, three, one plus one is two type of scripture that it's hard to interpret this any type of way. It's just like this. It's hard to interpret be at work 6 o'clock in the morning any other type of way. Isn't that right? It's hard to interpret you need to believe and be baptized to be saved any other type of way. It's saying it pretty directly. He's telling you what he's what he wants. Now he's saying this and it's like I said to someone else before. I said, how else can he say it in order for you to believe that you need baptism to be saved? I want you to really think about that. It's just like this up here. How else can your boss say you need to be at work 6 o'clock in the morning for you to believe you need to be at work 6 o'clock in the morning? I want you to really think about that. Because people keep throwing out this line. You have your interpretation. I have mine. But in reality. In earthly things. Do we talk like that? Will we tell our boss. Well you have your interpretation. And I have mine. You, you said this. But I think this. Okay. Will we talk like that? If we don't talk like that with earthly things, why are we talking like that with spiritual things? It's the same type, it's the same mentality, right? What will Christ do? You have here another example. Your boss sent, sent you an email to join a meeting. Then he sent another email saying, join the weekly status meeting at 2 o'clock and bring the notes you took last week about the project. You read the first email, but didn't bother reading the second. You didn't join the meeting because you didn't know what meeting and didn't know what time and the boss didn't have your notes either. What would your boss do? you going to get in trouble, right? Pocket written up. Whatever. So what's going on here? Okay. You pretty much in this example, this per the person or is all confused, right? Because why? They only read the first email. They didn't read the second. Right? Let's look at 
another uh, and spiritual analogy of that example. Jesus answered in John six twenty nine. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. John six twenty nine. And Acts twenty two sixteen, and now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts twenty two sixteen. And Ezekiel eighteen twenty, the soul that sins it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Catholics say, to save infants, we perform infant baptism. So all these scriptures I was quoting before is connect. The reason why I was quoting them is to talk about this infant baptism for a second. So the analogy is, Catholics read Acts 22, right? Which is what? Now why terrorists thou rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So they read that, but they didn't read the other scriptures. They know they must baptize. But they're not following the part that one must believe and then be baptized. They're not following the part of infants will not inherit the sins of their fathers. So what will, so what will Christ do here? Right? That's the analogy from this, where there was just confusion on the, uh, the person's part because they didn't read the second email. There is confusion on the Catholic's part involving infant baptism because they're not reading John 6.29. They're not reading Ezekiel 18.20. The soul that sins, it shall die. The baby didn't sin, so the baby will not die a spiritual death, right? Isn't that right? I see no evidence of a baby not going to go to paradise. I see no evidence of that. So why do they need to get baptized? Okay. They have no sin on their soul. So Acts 22 does not... Um... It's not talking about them. Okay. Because why? They don't have no sense on their soul. Ezekiel 18.20 And also, as it just shows here, arise and be baptized. What is this? This is a commandment to the, to the sinners, right? Of course, an infant won't be able to perform this commandment because it's a baby. Isn't that right? But that's what we're talking about. All right. So this confusion with infant baptism that the Catholics started is because is I'm sure there's many reasons why they started this, but. One of the reasons is because they didn't read enough. They saw Acts 22, maybe. Didn't see John 6, 29, maybe. <laughs> didn't see Ezekiel 18, 20, I suppose. Or ignored it. Like, for instance, here, you read the first email but didn't bother reading the second. There's a lot of that going on, too. Isn't that right? And so, you didn't bother reading Ezekiel 18? I mean, what's happening? Right? So, what will Christ do? 
Isn't that right? We've seen some examples, but let's take a look at some direct scriptures. Okay. John 8, 20, 22. So what is this? What is we going to talk about? We're going to start looking at some scriptures. It's just a few um, about what Christ is saying about interpretation. John 8, 20 through 22. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he says, Whether I go, you cannot come. So what's going on here? In verse 22, they're saying, Will he kill himself? They interpreting what he said into suicide. That's what they're doing. He says, whether I go, you can't come. And they just say, he's going to commit suicide, I think. I don't know. That's what they interpreted as. Was that correct? No. He was going to be taken, pretty much murdered and crucified, right? But they didn't know that because they're not really paying attention to everything he's saying. And they don't really know their scriptures. And so this is how they interpret stuff, right? This is what happens when we don't look at the scripture or we don't listen to what, like in this case, what Jesus was saying, okay? Because back then, of course, there was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and all that. But Jesus spoke, which is the scriptures today, right? Jesus' words are scripture. They are not listening to Jesus' words. So they are interpreting things differently than the interpretation. Okay. Jesus has an interpretation for whether I go, you cannot come. He knows what he's saying. He has the interpretation. They misinterpret it. Right? Because they're not looking or listening to Jesus' words before, after, I mean, throughout. Right? They're not paying attention. Today, Jesus' words are written and people ain't reading it and they are interpreting things wrong right or misinterpreting just like they did right in Matthew 16 5 through 12 And when his disciples were come to the other side, okay, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves. Now look at this. Okay, so now they on the, I think, other side of Jordan or Galilee or something. And they forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Okay? So, this is scripture. This is something Jesus is saying. And now they're reasoning among themselves. Saying, it is because we haven't taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith. Why reason ye among yourselves? Because you have brought no bread. Do you not yet understand? Neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousands, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, 
that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Let me stop there for a second. Let's bring it back. Do you yet not understand this part here, verse 9? Neither remember, oops, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets he took up. Where was that? Now let me try to go here for a second. He said five loaves, right? I want to say, eh, I'm sorry, five loaves. Matthew. So, he's talking about an event that happened, and I'm sure some of you already know, but an event that happened in Matthew 14. Okay. So, let's think about this, because this is when he did the miracle in Matthew 14, right? So, just like today, if, let's say, we were talking about the five loaves and five fishes, or five loaves and the 5,000, we can go to what? Just like what I did. We can go to Matthew 14. Right? Scripture. Jesus went to Scripture. Okay? He went and said, you remember that event? Today we can say, do you remember that event? Or that Scripture? Jesus went to Scripture to say what? Y'all interpretation of taking, take heed and beware of the leaven, they took it as literal. That's what they did, the disciples. They said the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees is literal. That's what they did. And they said it's because we take in no bread, it's something. So they thinking it's the no bread, it's the leaven is actual bread. It's a literal, actual bread. But Christ saying, but that makes no sense. Don't you remember the scripture of the five loaves of the 5,000? We didn't have bread then or enough. But we didn't need it because of the miracle. I mean, he's miraculous. Right? He can generate his food. I mean, he don't need he don't need the bread, isn't that right? And then he goes to another scripture, right? Saying, or do you remember the seven loaves of the four thousand? How many passes he took up? So your reasoning that this is literal bread makes no sense with these other scriptures. Isn't that right? That's how you interpret, okay? Well, I mean, that's how I mean that's how you find interpretation. That's how you get through it because that's what happened here, isn't it? Because Jesus said those things in verse twelve. Then understood they. How that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. See, they got, they were reasoning among themselves. They were not reasoning with scripture. They were not reasoning, in other words, they were not reasoning with the word of God. No. They were reasoning among themselves. They looked at it. They say, hey, this must be actual bread. But then Jesus came, right, and says, that makes no sense. Do you not remember these scriptures? Isn't that right? Or these events that occurred? 
your interpretation is incorrect. You are misinterpreting it. And so because of the correction, they start saying, oh, that's right. And then they interpret correctly, saying it's the doctrine, which will be uh, consistent with all the other things Christ said when it came to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's always really their doctrine, their teachings, right? So it's consistent. The doctrine, to beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees is consistent with the stuff Jesus said before, or in other words, it's consistent with other scriptures. When they were thinking it was literal bread, it was no, they weren't consistent with the other scriptures, right? See, this is what it means to reason with scripture. Like it says, um, let me show this right quick, in Acts 17. Right, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days, and three Sabbath days, reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Okay. How did he preach? How did he teach? How did he convince people? He did so by reasoning with them out of scripture. What is that? What does that really mean? Sometimes, um, let's look at Isaiah 1. It's the same as saying, when God, he says, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve their oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow, come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they be as white as snow. Though be red, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Come now and let us reason together. When you reason with the scripture, you reason with the Lord. Okay. That's what they were doing in... Matthew, that's what Paul was doing. Acts 17, that's what you need. That's what the Lord was saying in Isaiah 1. You are reasoning, not when you reason with God, you're reasoning with the scriptures. You're not just thinking among yourselves, saying, Well, I think this is what this means. Well, I think that's what this means. I think that's what this means. And that's it. No, you got to look at the scriptures. What is consistent? Let's go. So, okay. Excuse me. So, some other uh, scriptures here. Second Peter one twenty through twenty one. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private or personal interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let's look at this. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So what does that mean? No personal inter interpretation. No, this is my interpretation. You have your interpretation. You have no. no. He's telling you that. He's like, why? Because this is not because the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. This ain't man's prophecy. Okay. But holy man of God spake as they were moved or inspired by the Holy Ghost. And let's look at something else. I, I'm not sure if y'all can see this. Google here. But I'm going to read Second Timothy 
I think it's second Timothy three. And then so in Second Timothy three, starting with verse um sixteen, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So we already have prophecy uh was written by holy men, inspired by the Holy Ghost or moved by the Holy Ghost. And sixteen or second Timothy three sixteen it says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So so what does this mean? You can't have your interpretation, I have mine. Okay. Not when it comes to God's word. Right. Let's also look at Jeremiah thirty six one and two. And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto you against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day I spake unto you, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. He's telling him, write. This is what you're going to write. So when they say inspired and all of this, this is what I'm thinking. Okay. Inspired means he's telling you like pretty much what to write. He's telling you like what to write. Okay. And Exodus thirty four one. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, or cut thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. Right? See, this is like, these are the words of God. Okay? It's coming from God. It's, the, it's coming from His mind, not from our mind. Okay? And e and even when it comes to us, when we say something, you know, through an email or text or whatever, we normally have what one interpretation, isn't that right? We have our the interpretation of whatever we said. He has the interpretation of whatever he said, isn't that right? Doesn't that make sense? Not only makes sense with reality, but it makes sense with what? Scripture, right? One can obtain the wrong interpretation by not accepting the scripture for what it says. Like what happened with Mark sixteen sixteen, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And you have people that are obtaining the wrong interpretation by simply not accepting the scripture for what it says. I mean, it says what it says. I mean, that's it, right? Also, one can obtain the wrong interpretation by not bringing the scriptures together as one. The interpretation. You only have the interpretation or a misinterpretation. There is no your interpretation and my interpretation. There's only the interpretation or a misinterpretation. So how to obtain the interpretation? Well we already saw it showed I already saw show some of that, right? By doing what I just showed you, you bring the scriptures together. You interpret it scripture with scripture God's word is going to explain what the scriptures mean but you have to study and you have to seek right you bring the scriptures together 
Okay. You get God's word to speak for you. Okay. When and to say God's word, you're talking about the scriptures. When you say the Holy Ghost, you're talking about the scriptures. You get the scriptures to speak what the interpretation means. Okay. It's like when it comes to baptism, I mean, if somebody read, he that believes in shall be saved, they may not under, really understand what that means. But then, or like why, and then you read Acts 22, 16, rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's why. Because this is what happens. This is when your sins get washed away. This is when you're added to the church of Christ. This is when you become, this is where your state changes. But first you must hear the truth, believe it, repent, confess, and then be baptized. And then God will add you to his church. Right? To the one church. The church of Christ. I hope this helps someone. May God bless you and may he bless you.